Hi everyone. We'll get started in we'll get started in a few minutes. We're just going to wait a little bit till people get settled. But welcome and good afternoon. All right, let's get started. I want to welcome you to today's Education Now episode. This series is created in response to COVID-19 and its impact on the education sector. And it's intended to provide concrete insights and strategies for educators, for families, for schools, and for district leaders. Um, as always, when I've hosted, I want to give a shout out to all the teachers and educators and custodians and receptionists and all the folks out there who are working really hard and wisely and courageously to, um, against uh, big obstacles to help kids learn right now. So big shout out to you. I am Rick Weisbord. I'm the director of the Making Caring Common Project here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'm also the co-director of the Human Development Psychology Program. And I'm a senior lecturer here at the Ed School and at the, at the Kennedy School of Government. Um, with the upcoming elections, today's conversation could not be more important, is more important than ever. Democracy is on the ballot. We are all thinking about democracy, how fragile it can be, how important it is to strengthen it. But too many young people um, don't know how their voices fit in. We have lots of young people out there who have dealt with historically, with exclusion, with marginalization. Um, many of those have turned away from politics. And one of the things that we are going to be talking about is how do we engage all of our young people in these conversations and in this work of strengthening democracy. This is an action-oriented webinar. We're going to share tools to rethink what civics is and what it can look like and explore concrete steps that educators and families can take to help young people become informed and constructive and ethical and active community members who advance equity and advance change. First, I want to well, first I, I want to do a little housekeeping, and then I want to introduce our fabulous speakers. The housekeeping: today's episode is being recorded and will be available to view on the Harvard Education YouTube channel and Facebook page. Or you can also visit hgse.me/ednow for recordings and information on future episodes. Um, I also wanted to remind you to please submit any questions you have throughout today's webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You'll also find closed caption access there. I'm going to engage these folks in discussion for about 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to have time for your questions. So we will be delighted to hear questions you have on this topic. Uh, let me introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, first. Uh, Amber Coleman Mortley is Director of Social Engagement at iCivics. She is a blogger and a podcaster, and we are delighted to have her here. Muria Hyatt is a, got her master's degree here at the Ed School in 2015. She is a civic engagement and equity researcher at Circle at Tufts University, which is a terrific organization. Circle is a terrific organization. Jessica Lander got her graduate uh, degree at the Ed School in 2015 as well. She is the co-founder of We Are America. She is a high school teacher and a journalist who I've known for many years. And we are, it is wonderful to have you um, with us, Jessica. So please join me in welcoming them. Big applause for them. Thank you. All right, let's let's get let's get started. Uh, so Give me a sense of what you, let's start with a big one. What do you hope civic engagement looks like? So when you see where it is now, what do you hope it will look like in the coming years? And what thoughts do you have about how we might get from here to there? And if any of you want to jump in, that would, that would be great. Anyone want to launch? Go ahead, Amber, that would be great, launch us. All right, so, you know, I think that the future of civic engagement should be student-led, right? Um, we want to make sure that you know, we're facilitating space and opportunity for students to pursue their passions, whether it's through project-based learning, whether it's through games and simulations, 
Um, you know, whether it's through like just going out in their community and being active and informed civic actors. So, you know, that the first thing I would say is student led. Yeah, can I let me just ask you a question about that, which, you know, which makes total, which makes total sense to me, but what are the, what's the role of adults? Yeah, so the part of the role of the adults are to facilitate that space, right? Um, to serve as a resource hub for students to connect them with the levers of power so that their um, efforts are fruitful. Um, also to get out of the way, right? So I think, you know, we as adults love to have that control. We love to feel like we're in control. You know, part of it is allowing the process to unfold organically as well and be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. Trusting yeah. the process, right? Yeah, great. Uh, Nura, Jessica, do you want to jump in? On this? Yeah, I, I want to say that, you know, if I were to rethink civic engagement or civic education um, or the future of it, I really want that ecosystem to be connected of all of them for students and equity-centered civic learning space. So, you know, the K-12 civic education system connected to parents and communities and that we center student voice both in schools and communities, um, in decision-making process in the classroom and outside of classroom. So students really see the lived civics experience where adults are facilitating that space, as Amber said. Um, but it's a connected community with institutions interacting with each other, like schools, like parents, like local community organizations that work with youth, like media and local newspapers. Um, so to me, a vibrant community that brings together everyone, the school system and the community to work together for students and students who are not in school together to um, center their voices, young people's voices um, in how democracy shapes in the future. Yeah. And I'll oh. jump in on that. Um, Go ahead, Jessica. I think it's like, I absolutely agree on the importance of student voice. And I think when I think about civics in the classroom as a high school teacher, I think about the term action civics. And so I think historically um, schools have thought about civic knowledge, which is really important for us to teach. And I think about in the classroom also teaching civic skills. What are the uh, concrete skills my students need to be able to create change in the community? And then civic motivation. Do they believe that they have a voice in their community that will be listened to? Uh, do they want to create change in their community? And so I think we need all three parts, um, not just the civic knowledge, while very important, but also that civic skills and the civic motivation. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. I might add one more, which is civic efficacy, like the belief, and, and it's very related to motivation and skills, right? The belief that you can be an agent of change. Yeah. So, you know, I and know I'll add, I, sorry. Go ahead, you go so ahead. I'll just add to the efficacy point that not just student efficacy or agency or skills to do it, but also teachers so that they know how to enable students to do that. So teacher efficacy, teacher skills, knowledge, and confidence to be able to enable students also really matters in yeah. how this, if this happens. Yeah, great. So now let me ask you or, Je or, or Amber, Jessica, any of you, you know, I realize we may have to go back a little bit before we go forward. What is the current, what do you, what is sort of the current landscape of civic education in the U.S., you think? Like, what, what is, to what extent does it exist? I know in some states it really doesn't exist in any formal way, but can any of you kind of fill us in about the landscape? Like where we are now? I can jump in. So, you know, civic education historically, you know, in the past few decades has declined, right? Because of competing priorities or subjects, there has been a lot of focus on STEM subjects or science and civic education has not had a level playing field as a lot of teachers tell me, right? It's not given the same amount of time or it's one module in a social studies classroom. Um, one teacher I talked to this summer said, I'm a seventh grade teacher and civics is tragically neglected up to the point point. And the when students come to me, you know, I have to really start from scratch. So it's not just that's one class, it's you know, a development trajectory throughout school life that is really missing. So it's not interwoven the way it used to be in school and outside of school. 
So we have seen that, but there has been a lot of pockets of promises that we at Circle have seen. So one of the areas that we've been working in was the state of Illinois that passed, you know, state-led mandate to um, enhance civic engagement and civic education in schools. Massachusetts just passed one as well. That has really helped. And where they where it has really helped is supporting teachers, teachers to be able to, you know, as Jessica said, ha give students that skills, that motivation, um, as well as the knowledge to be able to be engaged and informed civic actors. Um, and that's roped in more teachers to, you know, teach in that participatory manner. Um, it's also roped in students of like, you know, once they see the transformative power of their voice um, and connected to history and knowledge, um, that really helps. So it has depleted, but I think there is a movement to really integrate civic education as an interwoven theme in schools as an interdisciplinary or across disciplinary subject. Um, and we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing promise there. I wanna jump in that, you know, iCivics was part of that work in Massachusetts to get um, that legislation passed. Um, and so, you know, we've also built a coalition of over 120 organizations, the Civics Now Coalition, where we're working to get, you know, high quality, comprehensive, equitable civic education standards passed uh, from state to state. Um, a lot of our work is, you know, concentrated around, it's like, it's not just about passing, you know, a mandate, it's also about what is going inside that legislation, what is being taught. Um, we're also doing a bit of work uh, with the Educating for American Democracy um, movement uh, that's funded by the NEH to integrate history and civics together. So again, it's not just about like, let's just pass, you know, let's right. get some policy passed. What are students going to learn? You know, how do we align it to best practices? You know, how do we get the best minds um, involved in that work so that students get the most out of, of this experience? Absolutely. And I think the, the mass bill is really interesting um, that both Noria and Amber have mentioned that like this was a bill that passed in 2018 and it's really a landmark uh, bill in that it re both required that civic education be taught um, and it also required that project-based civic education be taught in the high school and that's really different. And then it went further and funded that. So it funded schools to train teachers because I think one of the big things is teachers don't know how to teach civics well um, in this different way of thinking about action civics. And so we need that funding, that support, otherwise there's an equity issue. Um, wealthier districts will be able to teach project-based action civics and uh, less resource districts won't. And so I think what's really powerful about the Massachusetts legislation that passed and the funding attached to it is that it starts to level the playing field. Um, it's not there yet, we need more funding for it. Um, but I think there's a real model there that other states could look to in thinking about what are the things we need funding, we need training, we need this to be for all schools, not just for some. Right. So Circle was part of like talking to teachers and understanding how it was rolling out, particularly because most of the rollout was post pandemic or during a pandemic. <laughs> so we heard a lot of teachers from elementary to high school and how this is going and what do they need going forward. So yeah. Yep. Great. Great, thank you. Um, Jessica, let me ask you a question about um, your work with students and it's related, I think, to what you just said about action civics. I know that it is important to you to bring in the lived authentic experience of students into this work. And if you could just talk to some about what that looks like and what that means and how you do that. Yeah. Sure, um, so I think probably easiest is through a quick example. Um, every year in the spring, my students, I teach about 150 recent immigrants and refugees up in Lowell, Massachusetts. I'm a public high school teacher. And every spring we work with uh, the national nonprofit Generation Citizen to do an action civics project. And so my students start off with identifying issues in their community they care about deeply. Um, so a couple years ago, some of my students, when we were starting this project, realized that a lot of their friends were hungry. Um, and so we started diving into, well, let's learn about food insecurity. Let's learn about how food insecurity affects learning. And then they went about calling the food pantries in Lowell and learning about who had access to food and who didn't. Um, they decided that to support their peers who couldn't always access the food pantries because of the times of day that the food pantries are open, that they wanted to open a food pantry in our school. 
So then they went about calling food pantries across the state that were located in schools. And then they reached out. I remember the afternoon where my kids are texting me going, we set up a meeting with the food bank um, in the district, in the, uh, the, um, the county. Can you be there for the meeting? And this is my kids taking this on. Um, so they set up a meeting with the food bank and they wrote up a proposal. They did a cost analysis. They did a location analysis and the logistics. Uh, they wrote up a 20 page proposal, presented it to the district, uh, to the school. And uh, about seven months later, opened a food pantry in our school, which is still running three years later. Um, I think it's a, a really, for me, a powerful example of concrete civics. Um, mm -hmm. It's my kids learning how to create the change they wanna see, learning all the skills from memo writing to conducting surveys, to holding meetings with uh, decision makers, um, and then figuring out how you actually get it done. I think that part is the practice of it. We can't just talk about civics, we have to practice it. Mm -hmm. um, and I see that impact with my students. I mean, I have a student who her senior year worked on addressing Islamophobia and uh, she graduated. She came back the following fall to teach uh, with me in my class while she was a student at community college because she cared so much about action civics. And she did that for three years straight. Um, she's now, uh, she was putting herself through community college. She just became a US citizen during the pandemic and she's hoping to run for elected office. And so you like see the impact, it's but it's got to be local yeah. and yeah. it's got to be um, action oriented. Yeah. Um, thank you and, and super encouraging. Uh, I have a million questions for you, but we're going to have to move on just in the interest of time. And I have a question for Amber because Amber, you are also a parent and you have three kids and um, I'm wondering how you think about this in the context of your family and how you think about your kids preparing them uh, for civic for civic life, um, both now, it doesn't have to be preparation, how they're involved now and how you think about preparation. Yeah, so, you know, I say this all the time, every space is a civic space, every community space is a civic space. So I kind of run our home like a democracy, right? Uh, we have a family constitution. You know, my goal is that when my, stud my students, my kids <laughs> leave my home, they're searching for democracy everywhere. They're searching for how do I elevate voices of others? How do I bring other people to the table? Um, they have a, la a layer of uh, critical thinking when applied to everything, a bit of healthy skepticism so that it forces them to explore and, and look for sources to support uh, what they're saying. So, you know, with my kids in my home, and like, you know, democracy is an experience. It is connected to every single thing we do from the sports teams that you're on to the school that you walk into, to the job that you, you go into. Um, you should be looking for spaces that want elevate people's participation in the process of making the decisions that rule all the people in that space. So, you know, on our, in our podcast, we discuss these kinds of things, um, you know, and we try to model these things to help other parents understand how actually easy it is to facilitate democratic experiences in your home. It's super easy, like. <laughs> So, I agree. As a fellow parent, I agree. <laughs> you're a parent too. Anyway, I, I, so Amber, let me but let me ask you. This is um, I I'm completely with you about families are um, places to re, to enact democratic processes. But what if your kids say, "I want to stay up. They vote. I want to stay up till four in the morning watching trashy TV." Like, what happens then? Like, how do you think about your role? In, how do you think about your role in this democracy? Yeah. So you. You cater the freedoms to the appropriate level, right? So you don't want to just open it all up to a four-year-old, right? Um, just like you wouldn't hand your keys over to like your 16-year-old and tell them you can drive wherever you want without me being in the car with you. Uh, you want to be with them along the way in the process and you want to create opportunities for you to have discussions on, you know, why is it unhealthy for you to stay up until 4 a.m. and watch TV? You know, what are some compromises? Maybe on the weekends you can stay up until midnight, right? Um, what are ways that we can leverage privileges so that you get a little bit of what you want and I get, you know, some of what I envision is what I want as the parent. Um, and so that teaches them how to negotiate. It teaches them how to compromise. Um, it teaches them, you know, that 
one, wielding all the power is not what the end goal here is, right? We have to live in the space in a community together. So hopefully that, <laughs> hopefully that helps out a little bit. I think that's inspiring. I really, I, I hope everybody took that in. That, that was, that was wonderful. I, I would add Professor Weisbord that if like trashy TV will also have issues that are civic or political. So, you know, young people do, do care about issues more than they care about political parties or stuff like that. So if your teen is watching that, you know, nine times out of 10, there would be some kind of issue that you can draw a connection to of like, why do you think this exists? Um, what political space has enabled this? So I think you can use that as a talking point over your dinner table um, and see where that goes and you know, what they think about I, it. I agree with you and I'm relieved because I watch a ton of trashy TV too. So. <laughs> um, so, you know, I want to ask you, we, there's some wonderful questions in the chat box, and I want to get to the chat box, but I just have to ask you one more question, which is about barriers. I mean, the barriers that you find in this work, and they could be district barriers, school barriers, or they could be barriers that are in kids or students' lives that you're encountering. Um, and I just, if, you'll all have to be brief, I'm sorry, but I'd love for um, you to share a couple of thoughts on this. And whoever wants to start. Nuria, you want to start this time? Yeah, sure. I'll start with the overarching because I know the teacher and the parent will want to talk about it. So, you know, I think from our research at Circle, we see that a lot of youth actually live in what we call civic deserts, right? They're not, there's like a lack of opportunities of institutions, of spaces where they can have their voices heard, where they can actually understand what issues matter to them, connect their creativity and social media and otherwise to to their community engagement, to issues they care about, and to casting a ballot. So um, I, would, I would say a lot of barriers that young people face are actually around access to information and awareness. So parents or everyone in the ecosystem that I talked about think their job as adults is to facilitate that access to information and for outreach and for awareness building. Thank you. I'll jump in and say, uh, parents don't know what they don't know, right? Um, a lot of us ha as uh, adults have not had a high quality civic education ourselves. And so this expectation and pressure on us to teach kids or to facilitate this awesomeness in our own homes, you know, that's a bit overwhelming when we ourselves did not get a high quality civic learning experience. So we, there, that is a barrier there. Parent education is a barrier. Um, break, educators being able to bring parents in on discussions uh, is also another barrier, which I think remote learning has melted away just a bit. Um, so I would say we don't know what we don't know, and none of us are getting the best uh, training and skills and information for that at, at this moment. Great, thank you. And then I'll jump in with um, adults need to listen more to young people. Um, and I think that comes through in um, helping ensure that kids know that uh, they do have a voice. I think of every time halfway through the semester when we're working on action civics, there's that moment when we're writing to the mayor or the school committee or representative and they'll turn to me going, so miss, this is a fake email, right? We're not actually gonna meet with them. And then I get to go, no, we are actually gonna meet with people and their eyes get really big and their mouths drop. And that's that moment of, this is real for them. We're actually doing this. This isn't pretend. And then they go to these meetings and I've heard this from my students where they come out and they've been listened to and they've been respected. And like, that's such a transformative moment. And you see it many months later when they're all excited about an issue or angry about an issue. And they come running into my class going, miss, I wanna write an op-ed about this. How can we do something? Can we create a survey? What can we do? And it's that, we, we need to make sure that we're listening to our kids, telling them that their voices matter, showing them that their voices matter. Thank you all very much. Let me, these are ter terrifically thoughtful and helpful comments. Let me turn to our questions. We have some really interesting questions here. The first question is, how can we empower our students to lead without overburdening them, overburdening them with the consequences of our mistakes? I know, it's a, take a deep breath. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I felt that in my soul, like as a parent. I, know, I, I deal with this every day. So person who dropped that question in, that's amazing. Um, 
Yeah, I think a lot of adult life, unfortunately, has been like, I got to rectify the wrongs of my past. Um, you know, I will take my own personal approach where I tell my kids, I'm separating my trauma and my experiences from your own. And so what do you need right now in this moment? Let's center, you know, your ideas. Let's center your strategies. Let's talk about what matters to you the most. Let's talk about how history and how you show up in your identity. You know, my daughters, you know, they're, they're black women, young women. So it's like, how do you as black young women experience justice, you know, disproportionately in comparison to other people? Like, let's just be real and honest about all of the different ways that students are experiencing this world. And so I think we as adults need to be able to focus on the kid, focus on the individual child in our classroom or in our home and you know the whole class. What do they all need? What does this individual need? Thank you. Anybody want to add anything to that or should we? All right. Um, teachers are deathly afraid to go there with students during this polarizing time. I'm glad we were talking about this question. What suggestions would you give them in how to create this space while at the, t while at the same time managing their own bias? And bias may not be the right word, but their own political orientation, their own preference, their own political values. Yeah. I, I mean, I think for me, I, I think about how important it is to build trust in my community. And I'm struggling as a teacher in this time of COVID to build that trust when I don't get to be present with my kids in a classroom. Um, but there's still so many ways we can do that. Um, it's about making sure all voices are heard. It's about sharing values and also just setting ground rules of how we're gonna speak. Um, I think about a class I teach where we have difficult conversations every week for 45 minutes. They just, they sit in a circle um, and they, they talk and I sit on the outside. It will look different in the virtual space. We're still figuring it out. But um, there, there's some ground rules of, how do we teach young people and really how do we teach adults as well to speak from uh, the I voice uh, from not making generalizations, but here in my experience. Um, and I, I think that's the starting place. And what I see over the course of the semester is how powerfully kids are able to then share with each other to push each other, um, but in respectful ways, but it really starts with those those ground expectations of how we're going to respect everyone. And then also just building a, a community of like, what are our shared connections? Um, how do we empathize and understand each other, even if we come from different places? Because we always have parts of our experiences that we can uh, empathize with each other on. But it takes right. a lot of work. Right. Um, you know, I was just talking to a teacher um, this summer in Massachusetts, and one of them said that you know, my entire way of teaching is based on the modern scientific method. And if that becomes a point on of the, controversy uh, on, on, sci on scientific method, method yeah. I use scientific method and reasoning. And if that's a point of controversy, then I don't, I don't know how to teach. And I've shied away from all political discussion in my class. So those are really hard discussions to have. But yes, as Jessica and Amber said, do have those discussions. Um, but you need to lay the groundwork of trust, of ground rules, of how to have a civil discourse, give students the skills like media literacy, like how do you, you know, sift fact from fiction? How do you listen to the other person and how do you respond? And it's okay to disagree, but how do you disagree? How do you, you don't have to always reach a consensus, right? So all of those things, give students with the knowledge, give them the skills and then practice to do it as, as Jessica mentioned before. I want to jump jump in and just say to all the parents watching, like we have to respect that teachers are high highly trained professionals, um, and that they they have our mostly you know I want to speak mostly they have student best interests at heart, and so we have to partner with our child's educator, right? So you know believing that your child's educator is here to destroy your child is a narrative that I hope dissipates at some point. Um, we have to work with our children's teachers. We have to leverage the PTA as a collaborative force with the educators in the school and with the principal so that every child gets the skills that they need in order to survive once their K-12 experience is done. So that's kind of like a call to action that I'm, I'm putting out there for everyone who has, who has kids in school right now. And can I jump on that? Because I think we have to do the 
opposite in schools too is we need to be honoring families. We need to be honoring parents. Um, schools historically have not done this. Um, and I think schools and teachers need to think about ways of really reaching out and collaborating and partnering with families who are our students first and most important teacher. And so where are the places where we can build bridges, where we can build partnerships. Um, but I definitely think two schools have a lot to learn to all my teachers out there. How can you partner? How can you learn from your families as well? Yeah. And the last point is don't do it last minute before the elections when you're about to have the hard discussion. You know, think about when you are developing your curriculum, designing the year, have that inclusive discussion so parents know and they can both foster that and facilitate that space and also support the teachers. So I just want to add one thing quickly here and try and squeeze in one more question because uh, these questions are great and you and you all are so thoughtful. I think we're going to go a little bit over time. Um, I completely agree with all of you about creating norms. I also think it's important to create moral norms in a classroom and, and moral norms that, you know, this is a classroom that respects freedom of speech, but also a classroom that expect respects people's right to freedom from violations of their rights and disrespect and and there's has to be careful attention to what burdens are you asking students to bear and who are you asking them to who are you asking to bear them when you're honoring free speech so those things are intention i think very important to lift up for for students um let me just ask one let me see if i can squeeze in one more question uh the question is about a, a, recent, a Pew study, a Pew research study, which is definitely fairly recent, that 70% of youth are cynical distrusters. How do we rebuild trust in democracy and not let cynicism degenerate into adversarial and polarizing behavior? And I guess there's two parts to this question I'd like to ask you. One is the degree to which you think the young people you work with are cynical and if you think the premise is right. And the other is, um, when they are, how do you think about it? And how do you think about working with them? Right. I'll jump oh, in. Sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I'll, okay. I'll go real fast. Um, you know, I work with our youth fellowship students, um, and there are students from across the country, um, all diverse backgrounds, rural, urban, suburban. And the one thing I'd say is, you know, for me and the students that I work with, that premise is yes and no, right? Yes, there's a cynicism, but also no, they feel empowered and responsible for creating the change that, that they want to see in their community. So that message is ringing through. So it's yes and no. Um, I'd also say like thinking locally, right? So the students in our program are super empowered because we're having them analyze the inequity that they experience and that they see within their own identity and within the communities that they're uh, living in. So, and in communion with, right? So, you know, for us, it's like, let's focus on this hyper local. You can definitely make changes here. You know, the higher federal level will get there, but local is where is where it's at. Right. So Circle just um, did a poll of young people too this summer, um, where we talked to a national representative, you know, group of young people. And exactly what Amber said, there is a healthy amount of skepticism and cynicism about about politics. And I think that actually translates to them questioning inequities, questioning looking at their communities. So 85% young people said that they believe they have the power to change things in the country. And more than eight in 10 young people said that the pandemic has made them realize that how things are interconnected and how they can make change in their communities. Um, six in 10 young people said that um, they are part of a movement and the members of their movement will vote to express their views. So there might be cynicism, but there is definitely connecting their issues to local engagement, to bettering their communities, um, and to understanding that this matters. And I think this is where we talked about the 30 minutes of how to facilitate that space of, you know, you're just coming, you are able to cast a ballot, what does that look like, and how to connect that to the issues you care about and all the feelings that you just talked about. I 100% agree, and I know we're close to time, but like it's about the local. I've never met a student who doesn't care about something in their community. Yeah. Um, our kids are deeply passionate, and so I agree with Amber. It's the yes and no um, that they might be cynical about maybe national politics, 
but they do care about issues. And so it's giving them the tools they need to go tackle the issues they care about. And then as they tackle those issues, they then see ways that they can tackle other issues in their community. Great. Well, thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a wonderful discussion. I learned a lot. I think our audience learned a lot. Thank you to the audience too for these really um, thoughtful, thoughtful questions. Um, I want to just leave, we're going to leave you with these takeaways uh, and you can just read them at your leisure. Um, these are takeaways that our speakers gave us. Um, but thank you all one more time and be well, everyone, and, and take care. And I hope you will tune in to the next Ed Now.